I'm not going to worry about it right now. Uh, Joan has her Kataro shirt on. Did you notice it? Yes. Because, uh, why don't you show everybody your... It wasn't because the next Saturday... Show everybody your Kataro shirt. Okay. Okay. That's this Kojiki. Is one of the first. This is the Kojiki. Kojiki shirt. That's the dragon. And no. Yeah, yeah, but that's not the first album he made. Um, I don't know how many of you. Well, you got the tape. That that's a great concert. In fact, he does the Kojiki concert on that tape, and that's worth saying. <coughs> There's a fellow who wrote a book um, that I found interesting, and of course, it's not going to change the world around, but it deserves some attention, I think. Um, and his name is Lawrence Lyons. And the name of the book is The Language Crystal. And it's interesting to, to take a look at some of the things that he's um, uncovered and just think about the origin of your family, the name that you have, why you have it, what does it mean, why was your family called by that name, uh, has it manifested itself into some kind of a reality, and in general it, the case is it, it does, and what he does in this book is analyze numbers and names and suggest that they do define the very lives that we lead. Let me give you an example. For those of you who are watching on television, of course, uh, <coughs> we have in New Jersey one of the meccas of gambling in the world, which is Atlantic City. Now, you would have to think, what would the chances be of, say, the most important person in the city bearing the name of the most important card in a poker deck. The man who is the most important man in Atlantic City, his name is Trump. Which is, a, which is an amazing thing. What are the chances of that? Yeah. Right. Of all the billions of names and millions and millions of people, here he's the head of a gambling mecca, really. And his name is Trump. So he is almost ordained from the very, very beginning. And here is, in other words, look at look what, what what can you think of in the Bible when you see this? The word was made flesh. Do you see? And, and that's the kind of thing that um, Lyons is looking at. He analyzes the word and 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 what is it, he suggests, is the second coming, is the Word itself. In other words, uh, the changes that are uh, coming as a result of those things that we have been named, and, and they manifest themselves. In other words, what he's saying, the names and the meanings of our names have left us, and now they have returned, and, and we're starting to, to find ourselves in, meshed in them. And jo John 1.14, it says, And the Word is made flesh and dwells amongst us. And so the words... The names describe where you came from, what you were labeled, because the words have meanings and manifest in physical reality, as his does. You know. and, and, and you would probably find it very interesting if you found out what your last name means, because your last name has a meaning. Well, why was your family called that? See? And then if you take your last name, combine that with your husband's last name, it becomes very interesting how the two come together, and now you have another meaning. But, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a reality that comes, and it manifests itself into a physical awareness. We've, we've discussed over and over again, for instance, the, the left brain, the right brain, the meditation, and all that. So let's look at the scriptures just one more time, uh, and, and so we can set ourselves biblically. In, on page 886 in those little Bibles, we go to John chapter 21, page 886, John chapter 21, and in John chapter 21, verse 6, Jesus says, cast your net to the right side, and you will find. Now, what I want you to do is, are you looking at that, or if you've written it down, it's a word, it's a printed word. 
cast your net to the right side, and you'll find. Okay. In talking to a friend of mine once, I was trying to show him the metaphysical meanings and the symbolic meanings of Scripture, and he said, well, couldn't he be telling them that the fish is on the right side of the boat? Well, I said, well, why waste? Why waste that? I mean, you know, if you're, if you're good at that, he could get a job, but I mean, it's not a big deal. <laughs> I mean, for somebody who's supposed to be the son of God to tell people where they can catch fish, is, you know, it's kind of a waste of his talent. But anyhow, cast your net to the right side. So we, we realize that he is saying that if you'll energize the right hemisphere of the brain, you'll find that which is life, that which is new. Well, how do you do that? How do you do that? Now let me show you how you manifest this and how it manifests itself. That's very interesting. How do you cast your net to the right side? Okay. The right brain processes music and art. In our meditation, we are very tuned in to music. Therefore, when you go to a meditation and there is music, you automatically start to have activated within yourself the right brain. So you're casting your net to the right side simply by meditating to music. And that's why uh, Buddha himself suggested that meditation be done with sound. Because it is the right brain which processes that. It's the creative part. Whereas the written word that you have in front of there is processed by the left brain, the intellectual side. And that's why it says in Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered in my name, well, that means in the way that I tell you, there so I am in the midst. So that when you gather then, and you do this in this meditation process, I is in the midst. And that I is the center, that center place of all consciousness, which is actually the, the realm of what we call God. How do words fulfill themselves? Lyons comes up with a very interesting thing. Watch this. And, and maybe if you can zoom in, Tommy, so they can see this. Uh, uh, why don't we write it? It might be interesting. The National Aeronautic, well, I don't know how to spell aeronautic, and Space Agency. We know that. Cape Canaveral, Florida. No problem. Okay? The word NASA. Okay? You know what they do. The word NASA, okay, in Hebrew means to lift up and travel forth. Is that interesting or what? To lift up and travel forth. So now who, where did this come from? You know, is it, who, how does it come, you know, come together like this and provide us with a fulfillment. In other words, the Word is made flesh. The Word itself manifests itself into a reality to lift off and travel forth. Here's, a, here's, a, here's another interesting one. We can use the Bible. Probably, once again, I won't be able to spell this, but uh, C-H-E-R-N-O-B-Y-L. Chernobyl. Do you remember in when the Soviet Union was the Soviet Union, this was a nuclear reactor, and they had a meltdown, and you know, lots of people got killed, and all kinds of you know, bad things happened. Well, Chernobyl, actually, when this, you know, this poisoned the whole earth, Chernobyl is a Ukrainian word. And the word Chernobyl means wormwood. That's what it means. Worm wood. That's what the word Chernobyl means. Now watch. Over the Bible, go to page 1007. And you're at the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 8. This is why this stuff is fascinating. This is not, this is not going to deliver you into nirvana or whatever, but it's interesting because there is an intelligence that presides in the universe, and these things are somewhat ordained. In other words, when it says the word is made flesh, it really is. And here's another example of it. Chernobyl means worm wood. And watch. Revelation chapter 8, verse... 10, and the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, 
and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Is that interesting? So, you know? So, in other words, when this was named Chernobyl, had this been doomed from the very beginning? The word, see, I'll, I, can I get through here? The word is made flesh. That's what the scripture is saying. In other words, the meaning of the word manifests itself. It can fulfill itself. What you call things can manifest into reality because that's what they are. So they, in other words, the word has power. And that's why your name is very interesting. And you should, you should look up what your last name means, and then what your first name means, put the two together, and then try to say, you know, how did our family get this name? Um, if you remember uh, Jim Baker of PTL, he had a tremendous religious uh, organization, and he intercoursed with Jessica. Jessica Hahn. That's right. She was uh, kind of a fast lady at the time. What does it say in the Bible? The downfall of the church comes from that which is the whore of Babylon. Jessica Hahn was from Babylon, New York. And she brought his religious castle right down to the ground. So, you know, there's a fulfillment. There's that the word was made flesh. He intercoursed with the, I don't want to use that word, but the fast lady from Babylon, and down came the church and down came the temple. And it's exactly what it says. The who of Babylon will bring the church down. Okay? So, and, and indeed, that, that's interesting. Let's take a look in uh, this, in the, in the crystal language. He devotes a lot of time to a number, and I think um, you and I have, in the time that we spent together, we'll recognize number 18. Number 18 has a very special significance. Now look at page, you're in the, if you're in the book of Revelation, look at page 1010. Revelation chapter 13. Okay. And verse 8. 18. Revelation 13. 8. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. <laughs> in order to figure that out, that word score means 20, okay? That word score means 20. So you have 600, and 3 score is 3 times 20, which is 60 and 6. So you have 666. Six, six. Now when you add 666, six, six, it comes to 18. You take it further, and it comes to 9, which is the number of consciousness. Right now we'll stick with that number 18. Go to the very next paragraph, and I looked... Ch uh, chapter 14, and a lamb stood on the mountain, and with him 144,000 having his father. These are the ones who were saved, 144. Well, you take the one, and you take the two fours, and again, you've got eight, 18. Okay? Now, in Hebrew, the number eight means C-H-A. The number 10 is I, and you put them together, 18 equals C-H-A-I, pronounced chai, which is life. Did you ever, if you saw the fiddler on the roof, l'chaim, that was one of the l'chaim, good life. Sorry. And, 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 and so there we have this tremendous number, 18, which is all the way through the scriptures. Whether you go back into the Old Testament, you'll find everything is measured in cubits, which is 18 inches. Right. And it all is put in there to mean Life. Chai. Lachayim. Life. So now we see 18, and, and now we see also that this number 9 has even a, a, a different significance. It is life for sure. And so then the sign of the beast, the beast is life, a lower life, where the sign of that which is salvation is a higher life. And yet it is translated to you or transmitted to you under the guise of a number, in numerology number 18. Okay. Let's take a look at the various stages. This is interesting. Maybe he's stretching it, maybe he's not. I, I don't think he is. I think, I think it's very interesting the way things work out. Because, you know, I, you could someday, I don't know, you're interested in astronomy, and that, that whole thing 
when, when scientists look at, at the universe, it's a, it's a fixed set of laws. I mean, it is an intel, intelligent setup. It can't be just, you can't just throw something like that together without it bombarding. I mean, if you just, if you and I were to make a universe, what if Ethel made a universe? <laughs> and, you, and you put all the stars in the comments, they'd be smashing into one another and clobbering, you know, they'd go bang and crash. Nothing ever, you know, oh, occasionally a meteor hits here. But what I'm saying is all of these millions and billions of things go around and nothing. It's like, did you ever see a school of fish? You can see billions of them. And they'll fish this way and then they'll swim this way and they never run into one another. Never run it, never even touch one another. And there's billions of them. And you think, well, zip, and all of a sudden, zip, and then zip, zip, zip. So here, you know, you have something that is extremely intelligent. You know, it proves there is this tremendous uh, force of intelligence. But in, in the five stages of life, you have earth, water, air, fire, and the renewed mind. I, I, of, of all the times I've said this, Albert, I, I don't think, I, I, don't, I don't really even think here that I've gotten through to people that this is baptism. This is baptism. Most people who have been baptized have never been baptized. Never been baptized. They say, well, yes, I was. I was baptized in the Bamber Lake or I was baptized in the pool. You've never been baptized. Because that's just a symbol of this. See, these are the stages of consciousness in Greek. The earth is your, your mind, your, your, your brain, your, your ego. The water is the second stage of consciousness reached by meditation. When you take your mind into this stage, now you're dunking your head in the water. When you come out of the water, you rise up to the third stage, which is air, which is separation from thought. And it's the same way as if you went down to the lake, they took your body, put it in the water, came up into the air. But here now you're at the third stage of consciousness. Then you rise up to the fourth stage of consciousness, which is fire, and then the renewed mind. That's baptism. There's five stages of consciousness. In Greek, there's five stages in every culture uh, of the universe. Okay? What is it in there that is strictly human? What is it in there that is strictly for mankind? It's not the earth, because pussycats use the earth. It's not that. It's not the water, because fish use the water. And it's not the air, because birds use the air. It's fire. It's spirit. The sole utilization of that fourth stage is human spirit. A human spirit. Okay. So the words are made flesh and dwell amongst us, and the words are meaningfully manifesting themselves. Watch this one. I think, I think you'll find this very interesting. Our last election, our president, okay, at the time, was a gentleman by the name of George Bush. Now watch how, watch how the word becomes flesh. George Bush. And the name George Bush means the sign of the wine merchant. That's what his name means. Sign of the wine merchant. George Bush. Hmm. His campaign manager was Jim Baker. Not the Jim Baker from PTL. Jim Baker. So here now, this looks like we got something going here. Because do you see what we have? This is bread. We have the bread and we have the wine. Good combination. Very successful. Looks like it was going to make it big time. But along comes a guy named Dan Quayle. Okay? And the word quail, it's, a, it's an old English name. Get this, that means to quench. That's what the word means. To quench. Now, here you have the bread and the wine coming together. This is communion. This is spirit. So this is going to be very successful. Open the Bible with me for a minute and go to page 967. The rest of you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19.
Okay, and we'll show you something. If I here, okay, if I can find it. First Thessalonians chapter five and verse nineteen. What does it say? It says there, quench not the spirit. The bread and wine coming together, a spirit, great success, but now you got Dan. Qu so here's a prophecy. The word becomes flesh. Indeed, you know, not taking anything away from this man, he's a very intelligent man. Something went wrong, and he quenched. He did. But it's, 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 this is exactly what's being spoken of here. Your, your words and the names actually manifest themselves and make things happen and change things. And of course, we know that that did. Dan Quayle and so forth and so on. Here's something interesting too. That number 18 is not only powerful in Hebrew, Lion shows how it can be very powerful in English. The 18th letter is R. And he shows you that by taking that 18th letter, which is a mystical letter in all languages, you can take a fiend and change it into a friend. Okay? You can take a beast, change it into a breast. And, and basically, so you change the entire characteristic by, you know, inserting a number. You can, you can do this with all different kinds of letters, I understand it. But the point is, you look at the numerical value of the letter, you look at what the letter means, it means life, and so life then predicates the breast as opposed to the beast, the friend as opposed to the fiend. Words and numbers and names have meanings and fulfillers or prophecies. And that's what Leonard Lyons in this book is trying to tell us. And so I would suggest that one of the things you might want to do is really um, get to the library or someplace wherever they do and look up your last name and see what it means. Because somewhere in your family, whether it be eons ago, there was a characteristic that is handed down in your genetic makeup that has to do with why your name is what it is. And that, that char characteristic, you take it and connect it to another person and marriage or whatever, and now you have the duplicate. Why do, what do your children's names mean? And, 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 and how do they fit in with your maiden name and so forth? Here's the last one we, we, we'll do tonight. And uh, as I said, this, this, this may be reaching a little, but it's still interesting. The first three days of creation are recorded in the Bible in Genesis 1, verses 5, 8, and 13. That's the first three days of creation. In Genesis 1, verses 5, 8, and 13. Okay? Now go with me. The Great Pyramid of Giza is exactly 5,813 inches. 5,813 is the radius of a circle with a circumference of 36,000 524. And 365.24 is the exact number of days in an earthly year. 365. So, so, so what he's showing, and you know, as I said, I, you and I cannot, this isn't going to change anything we do, but it is interesting to know that there's something going on beyond where we generally walk, beyond what we generally see, and it's very fascinating. And uh, we live in a world of laws, we live in a world of numbers, and then to me, this is not, you say, well, this isn't coincidence, it means there is something happening, and there is something that is set down as a law that whoever this group is knows nothing about what this group is doing and yet everyone is doing the same thing. It's like when they all, everybody has a Noah's Ark story because, and, and, and they never met one another and they all change it and have it by a different name because it fulfills a mythological theme. But we've got to go beyond what we've been taught in religion. I mean, what I want you to just see with this is there's so much that lies right beyond the veil on the other side that you know nothing about. You have no idea. Here you have George Bush, Jim Baker, the wine merchant and the bread merchant. They're going to come together, the bread and wine. Everything is honky-dory, and they pick a guy whose name is Quench, and he blows the whole thing. And they didn't know it. Okay. So, 
<laughs> Maybe if, um, you know, your name means wine, which is spirit, you wouldn't want to marry somebody by the name of quail, which means quench. Say, who knows? Jesus said you take away the key <coughs> when you don't enter within yourself. And that's where I think we, we begin to discover all these things and look at them. There's, there's surely a key that all things have been going on and are part of our own creation. And that's why we say, speak the word and I'll be healed. But what is that word? Say. So there's a lot more to life than religion. There's a lot more to life than we've ever chosen to look at before. And I just threw this in tonight because I just found it to be extremely interesting. Uh, you know, and, and I would very much suggest, too, that if you want to be fascinated, and if you want to find a book that you'll not be able to put down, because there is tons of stuff of people's names, and, and, and I mean, it's just bizarre. Pick up a book called The Language Crystal by Lawrence Lyons, and he provided the information, of, obviously, from his book tonight. But I would suggest that you do that. Uh, I know when we were away in Myrtle Beach, my sister had... A uh, chance to pick it up, and you know she's not a reader; she doesn't read books. But she said she couldn't put it down because <laughs> it is really a fascinating thing. So, uh, for what it's worth, uh, these things go on, and 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 for what it's worth, what it's worth also, there is definitely um, a, a sense of law and a sense of, of manifestation in words and numbers, and uh, that indeed is what is meant in the Bible when it says the Word is made flesh and dwells amongst us. Religion, on the other hand, hasn't the slightest idea. Most of us haven't the slightest idea. The world we live in, what surrounds us, and what it's made up of. See, that's what I think is so beautiful. Although, as I said, and I've been saying recently, I'm a little bit concerned about some of the things in the New Age, you know, are, are absolutely screwy, and, and I, I think really serve to do a lot of damage, and I'm not happy with them. Uh, but, on the other hand, what, what purpose it does serve is to allow us to explore I was talking to somebody in here, and they had a person who wrote them and contradicted uh, everything and said that all there is is what you can see, and all there is is what you can experience, and to keep running around looking for gods is a lot of nonsense. And um, my response to it was, okay, that's fine, and I, and, I, and I congratulate you, and that's where you're at, and hallelujah, have a good time. But there are some of us who feel that the world is not flat, and we just want to get on the boat and sail off. And we want to see if we go over the edge or if we find something. And we might discover some magic land somewhere. And that's the fun part, you know. And that's what, that's what makes this so interesting. So if you grab this book, I think you'll have a lot of fun with it and uh, find it to be very, very interesting. And just continue your search. Learn about numbers. Learn about words. You don't have to become a, an expert in it. But realize that in a strange way, these things manifest themselves. And uh, the word truly is made flesh. Yes. Yeah, Do you want to come up here? Then are you saying, too, that we have to be so careful with our words because of the meaning and what it does to a person when it comes into them? Are you saying that, Wow, too? that's good. And like then you, I go to the song that we used to play, Andy Williams' words. Yes, words are the key to life. Mm -hmm. Well, what he's trying to show here, and I think if you get the book, he, he does it in a very convincing way is that words actually do manifest into things. Uh -huh. um, you know, for instance, uh, here's the situation where my boss looks at me one day and he says, why are you driving this distance? Why don't you set yourself up at home? It's, these are just the words, it's a sentence. All of a sudden, now we're mm -hmm. looking and the thing's manifesting itself into a physical reality. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, all of these faxes will be going out and all changes will happen in not only in our lives, but I'm sure I will affect other people's lives. Mm -hmm. Like somebody said to me, you know, you're always the, 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 the revolutionary. The, if everybody's, mm -hmm. somebody's going to do something different, you know, you'll be it. So here I go again. Mm -hmm. and, but it's one thing to have somebody say something. It's another thing to see it happen, mm -hmm. you know, this, yeah. this whole thing. And when you make a statement like this, you, you set in motion a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah. And it's yeah. very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. But here I think what, you know, and I, and I only scratch the surface mm -hmm. about the things about people's names and, and what they've done. And people that you know of, I mean, you know, there's stuff in there about Marilyn Monroe and Kennedy and all of this stuff. It's just bizarre. Um, and what? Tell about the, what he says about dyslexia. That's really interesting. He, uh, Lyons began his career uh, as a teacher for dyslexic people. And he studied it very closely and <coughs> had a lot of problems 
with the uh, power structures of the schools who looked upon these people as retarded, he looks at them, dyslexic people as gifted. He says they are gifted, but they are speaking a language that we just don't understand. Not that they're wrong, simply because they're different, but they have access to a region that is beyond our ability to comprehend and that we should study and learn from them. It's a whole revolutionary approach to this thing. And he just became so frustrated with, you know, don't, don't do this, and you can't, and he said, what do you mean I can't? And he, he was trying to get these people who were dyslexic to teach other people, and, and, you know, if I had the book or you had the book, it's worthwhile looking at. But his approach to it was, here we're considering them to be retarded. I believe that they have been given a key of language that we know nothing about. So we think we're so wise, but we're acting very stupid. So that was pretty much it. Yeah, yeah it's pretty interesting. Pretty interesting stuff. Thank you. Farewell. Bon voyage. And we'll see you around the bed. Bye-bye.